Michael said at the outset that uh, he was talking about people who live in who live in uh, urban environments being cut off from the natural environment and therefore not realizing the extent to which we're dependent on the natural environment. Well, most of us, whether we live in an urban or rural environment, live on a terrestrial environment. We don't live on the sea. We have very little understanding and very little sight of what's happening in the oceans. Hence the visuals. This is a, a NASA uh, put together project to show you the surface movement on the oceans. It gives you some sense of the order and chaos that exists in the oceans. Just a smidgen of that sense because this is just the surface and we're only able to do this relatively recently. This gives you a sense of what's happening at the surface but the oceans are a three-dimensional environment so what's going on below that surface is completely different. What's going on in the deep oceans is completely different. So when we talk in goal 14 and it really does intrigue me that it's number 14 uh, then um, we are talking about a really huge subject about how we conserve and manage the oceans. The oceans are the drivers for our climate. We talk about climate change, but the ocean and the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere drives very much uh, what happens to us on land. Um, the, all of the fresh water, which is a tiny percentage of what's in the oceans, that makes it to the atmosphere, that makes it to be dropped on land, is simply returning to the oceans. It's simply passing through. It doesn't come from the clouds, it comes from the ocean. It goes back to the ocean. As Karen Blixen said, in out of Africa, the water is just trying to go home to the sea. So it's passing through our ocean systems. And how we have a healthy blue planet, as those of us of the Attenborough generation understand, we live on a blue planet. Two thirds of the world is covered by ocean. The, all life has come from the ocean. Everything that's on land has come from the ocean. And uh, I think, therefore, the goals and the challenges that we face in trying to live up to goal number 14 are enormous. And when we talk about the challenges we face on land, we have a much, much better understanding. We're closer to and we can see the systems on land. We understand very, very little about the oceans. We're catching up. This kind of technology is helping us. But really, we know very little about what happens in the oceans and the drivers in the oceans. If I take an example of um, the Anchoveta fishermen of uh, Peru, many years ago they noticed that their huge fishery disappears every now and then, just totally disappears. And they learned that they were watching the canaries down the mines. They were learning that they were watching the indicators of a significant climate change event happening in their area. In the, in the Pacific, the, water, the winds go from west to east, they blow warm water onto the Indonesian coast, it piles up there. At a certain trigger point in temperature, which is only partially understood, it changes the interaction with the atmosphere. The winds collapse, the pile of warm water collapses, it slushes back to the east. The effect is Indonesian rains stop, Indonesia burns, New Zealand has drought, South America and North America uh, have rains and floods. The hurricane season in the Atlantic slows and largely disappears. And this is a periodic event happened by a trigger point at a temperature at which the relationship between the atmosphere and the ocean changes. We know very little about those trigger points. So when we talk about climate change, two, three, four degrees, whatever we're facing, we don't really know what that's going to do to the ocean. Um, right. Are we a small country in Europe or are we a large country in Europe? In fact, we're one of the biggest countries in Europe. Our sea area that we have responsibility for is 10 times the size of our land area. So it's not Germany that's the big weight in Europe in terms of the natural environment that we control. It's Ireland is one of the biggest countries. And we've only begun to map what it is we're responsible for. And Ireland is very much ahead of the pack in terms of ma mapping the ocean. Most of the oceans on the Earth have never been mapped. We know very little about them. We know more about the surface of the moon and we've put more technology and more people on the surface of the moon than we have in the deep oceans. In fact, the deepest parts of the oceans have only been visited twice over the last 50 years and then for a very short time. Michael says two minutes, it's more or less impossible. I don't, can't do the kind of greyhound speed that Petra did. Um, the thing I wanted to focus on was, because you can talk about many things in the oceans, is the primary, or maybe the largest intervention we have in the oceans is fishing. Right? 
in that we impact very heavily on the fish. This is the current state of global fish stocks. Uh, and depending on whether you've been watching this or not, you can either get depressed or uplifted because it depends on the way you look at the trends. But there's certainly an enormous challenge. If we could rebuild, this is FAO, if we could rebuild the overfish stocks, we could increase global seafood production by 16 and a half million tons. And that is a challenge we have to face. By 2030, uh, FAO and the World Bank estimate that we will need an additional 74 million tons of seafood to feed the growing population and to address the 800 million people who are malnourished. At the moment, 4.2 million billion people are dependent in part for their animal protein for seafood. If we bring it back home, the fishing activity in our area, and this is very international and quite different maybe to some of the other issues, uh, the fishing air is highly international. About a billion tons of, of fish in excess of a billion can legally be taken out of that area under our conservation and management policies. And it's a challenge to keep it at that. Uh, but it's a highly international and Hans talked about reciprocity and international agreements. We can only manage the oceans through international agreements. You cannot do it from a nation state scenario. Um, the challenge of combining addressing the food security challenges and sustainability is a real challenge that we have to address and it's a big challenge. At the moment Europe imports two-thirds of its seafood. We're pulling in seafood from all around the world from many poorer countries than us that need that seafood and will need that seafood. So our, the Union has to become more self-sufficient in the seafood it produces. The new common fisheries policy is something that was agreed under the Irish presidency back in 2013. Long-term sustainability is at the core of that. Wild capture fisheries have plateaued for the last 20 years, and the best they will do going forward is about plateauing. And uh, they're producing around 90 million tonnes a year. And the challenge that we're trying to achieve is to get the fish stocks to maximum sustainable yield by 2020. And 2020 is an important, <coughs> in the marine world, is an important date. We're also trying to end discarding of fish at sea by 2020. And these two things coming together will reduce the waste uh, and the inefficiency in fishing uh, and will put stocks on a more sustainable basis. But achieving that is not a mean feat. The number of stocks that are currently fished at maximum sustainable yield, uh, you can see that it has been improving, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, and time is not on our side in some of these cases. One of the ways we're going to get there is through long-term multi-annual plans, but they are difficult to agree. One of the ways in which we can speed up decision-making is we agreed in the new CFP that we will bring in regional decision-making, whereby member states can cooperate in a much faster way than the previous EU decision-making structures, and that is working. The elimination of the discards will be a phased policy. It's working through from 2015 to 2019, uh, and that's being done through regional decision-making, which is a model for new EU decision-making. The uh, discard ban was brought in for the pelagic species last year. We're starting it on the demersal species this year. Uh, the other way in which the global food challenge and food self-sufficiency on seafood can be achieved, uh, and in fact maybe the only way, is through agriculture. And agriculture is an area that is going to have to grow if we are to stop uh, sucking in seafood from around the world. Uh, and that brings its own challenges, and it has to be done in a sustainable way. And it, both for itself and for the environment, and that will be a big development. All right, and uh, I'll skip through much of the rest because Michael is on my shoulder here. There's just a little picture of the science that we're currently doing on stocks. Science in the marine is still in its infancy, but there's a huge investment in marine science, and that will have to increase. The EU environmental legislation and the fisheries legislation are aligned. We're both working to this 2020 target. Good environmental status is linked to what can be achieved in the common fisheries policy, and the two of them are interwoven. And, right, just to give you a quick concept of how international the activity is, that we're, if we're going to achieve goal 14 uh, in our area, the type of international activity that we have to regulate. Uh, that's just a quick uh, site of the fishing vessels that are happening in our area on a daily basis. Um, this is 2014 to 6th of January 2014, speeds up as the year goes along. This is on the basis of the satellite monitoring and tracking that we do uh, and the control we try to effect uh, on the fishing activity in our area. Um, most of the vessels, or very many of the vessels, 
don't come to Ireland, don't land in Ireland, they come from elsewhere and they go back to those places. And these are the vessels that would be harvesting about a billion tonnes of fish. And uh, Ireland has the res control responsibility for that light area and it, it is critical that Ireland can effectively operate in that area through the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority and the, the Naval Service to ensure that what happens out there is in line with the conservation policies we're trying to pursue. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your patience, and I appreciate your attention as, uh, as the uh, sea talks draw to a close. Um, it was very exciting uh, to, to learn that the marine environment was included as one of the global goals, because the sea is really important. Um, it was described as too big to fail, I read in the Guardian uh, a couple of weeks ago by a prominent marine scientist. And this is because if we look at the other goals, climate change, the sea is crucial in controlling our climate. In fact, we'd probably be experiencing much worse effects of climate change, were it not for the fact that the sea has already absorbed an awful lot of the CO2, which has led to acidification, which is another, uh, another issue. Uh, if we look at zero hunger, Huge amounts of uh, uh, the planet's population rely on the sea for food, including here in Ireland. And we look at, uh, we don't have too far to look at uh, the island communities around our, our coast, which have suffered immeasurably from uh, the loss of fish and the loss of fishing opportunities. And the fact that you go to a restaurant um, in Galway and you're buying sea bass imported from Greece or your salmon farmed in Norway, etc. Where are all the fish gone because they're not there anymore? We look at responsible consumption and production. Any visit to the sea, uh, sadly these days, involves stepping over mountains of plastic, uh, bits of plastic bottles, uh, labels from uh, countries far and wide. So this is why the sea is really important, because it infringes on all the other uh, aspects of the global goals. This is a place. Most people are familiar with place when it's uh, breaded and uh, uh, fried in the pan, very delicious. Uh, few people get to see them alive. Uh, the stocks of place in Ireland have crashed by about 90% since the 1850s. And it's something that we need to realize that overfishing is something that hasn't just happened in the last 10 or 15 years, it's probably been going on since the Middle Ages. Uh, so we need to look much further back in time if we want to see uh, what our sea should look like and what a rich and uh, productive sea looks like. So uh, when giving talks, I believe uh, it is common practice if you want to deliver bad news is to sandwich it with good news. Um, I want to deliver good news, so I'm going to sandwich it with bad news. Uh, the fact is our sea is in a terrible state. These are just some uh, of the headlines that I picked off the internet last night from preparing this uh, slide. 99% um, of seabirds will have plastic in their stomach uh, uh, in a number of decades. Um, half of all marine life is gone. We're talking about fish, we're talking about sharks, we're talking about uh, uh, marine invertebrates. Uh, acidification of our oceans. We don't even know what uh, ramifications this could have. Um, an awful lot of marine life, particularly invertebrates, the types of shells that you pick up on beaches, rely on calcium to make their shells. In a more acidified ocean, they won't have that ability. And a lot of the species, we think of fish as breaded with a slice of lemon, but they are, they are species, they are uh, links in an ecosystem that is much more complex and diverse than we can begin to appreciate. And we see that if you look at, never mind over fish stocks, if you look at species in risk of extinction, uh, an enormous number, uh, I don't have it here in front of me, uh, were assessed as being at risk of extinction, 90%, I think, uh, when you look at sharks and other species that aren't even considered when it comes to looking at fish stocks. One of the great things about the global goals is that it has forced us, uh, as Michael said at the beginning, that it's about us. It's not about them. Uh, and if we look at our own uh, situation in Ireland, the seas around Ireland are uh, overexploited and heavily degraded. 
This uh, picture at the top here, this is a common skate. It's a very unfortunate name because it's critically endangered. And it was considered to be extinct in the Irish Sea uh, until recently. This photo came to me through our Twitter account um, by a, a person uh, who was on a pier on the east coast of Ireland. So on the one hand, we were thrilled, oh, maybe the skate isn't extinct in the Irish Sea. On the other hand, it's dead. And it was, uh, it was caught in a, in a trawl, in a fishing trawl. Uh, so the, uh, unlike um, eagles and uh, uh, badgers, etc., uh, none of these species are protected under Irish law at the moment. In fact, it is written into Irish law that sea life isn't even wildlife. And should the Minister for Heritage have the temerity to designate a species uh, for marine protection uh, as, as legally protected, uh, he or she would have to get the permission of the Minister uh, in charge of fisheries at the time. So that is the way that the sea uh, was seen and continues to be seen. Uh, half of our water uh, is polluted across the country. We have 42 towns, this headline is not old. Uh, discharging raw sewage into our estuaries and our seas. Uh, one third of our fish stocks that we know of um, are being fished sustainably. One third we know are not being fished sustainably and approximately one third uh, we simply don't know. Despite all the science and all the research etc we still see a lot of question marks when we get tables about overfishing. Okay so now for the good news. Um, we have a new common fisheries policy that is committed to ending overfishing and rebuilding fish stocks. So it's not just about reaching uh, magical lines on uh, statistical brochures. It's about rebuilding the health of the sea. We have a, a subsidy system in place that is designed to uh, benefit and to promote sustainability. We have environmental protection for the protection of birds and habitats and species. And we have uh, marine uh, strategy framework directive and the water framework directive that uh, are excellent in terms of its uh, ambition. So the bad news is that w where we have fallen down is on implementation. For instance, we've had 15 years of the water framework directive and still half of our water is polluted. This isn't acceptable. We have uh, SACs, all these, uh, these uh, shaded areas are protected areas in Ireland. You can see most of the coast is protected. Yet earlier this year, a scallop dredger was allowed to go into a protected area in Mayo uh, and scrape away the seagrass bed, which was a protected area. There was about 10 different agencies that were contacted. Everybody said it wasn't their problem, it was somebody else's problem. And it took about four months to get the proper uh, authority to regulate that activity, at which stage the seagrass bed is probably gone. So that's the bad news. Just to end on, uh, I suppose, opportunity, the fact that Ireland was instrumental in bringing these goals show that we can be in a leadership position. We have 90% of our uh, territorial area is, is the marine, so we have huge opportunity. But we need proper implementation. We need departments to be talking to each other, and we need proper consultation with other bodies so that uh, we can meaning meaningfully meet uh, the life below water target. Thank you very much.